Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari. This is Great Big History Podcast. This is our continuation of our History 101 lectures, China, Part 3, the Qin and the Han Dynasties. So we start with the Qin Dynasty. In longevity, not very successful. Impactful, yes, but it lasts one guy. That's not, in terms of dynasties, successful. We'll see the Han or the Tang, the Qing, the Ming, even the Yuan, even the Mongol dynasty lasted longer. So it's from 221 to 206, but it's impactful. So that's why we talk about it. And why? Well, it effectively creates China and the way China is going to act or exist for the next 2000 years, you know, so we have a first emperor. This is a guy who's not a tribal chief. This is not a guy who's a local king. This is a guy who creates the idea by conquering it of China, that there is a beginning and end, that the people are Chinese, that they should be in it, and that one person owns it. And it's the idea that there is a political entity called China. And so it creates a bureaucracy. You know, once you create China, you have to run China. You have to make sure the, the, you have power, you could collect taxes, your laws get followed. You need borders, who's in and who's out. China has to begin and end. And that is what the emperor controls. And then there has to be a unity of standards. How much does a pound weigh? How much does a how much gold goes into a dollar? You know, there needs to be standards on weights and measures so people can trade. There has to be unity of language of what do words mean? So that contracts, there has to be unity of law. Again, contracts, trade. Uh, if people move from place to place, are their customs the same legally? So you have to now, just saying I am the emperor doesn't get you anything. You now have to create all of this infrastructure that connects people to each other and to the state. The second thing is this cultural isolation. Remember, we talked about how China is at the eastern edge of Asia. It's not connected to the other major uh, civilizations we've talked about so far. The Qing, the Qin, not the Qing, the Qin continue that and go even beyond that. The emperor is the best thing ever. There is, there was no past before the Qin. They, in fact, start to burn the past. Confucius and his, quote, obligations, burn it, get rid of it. It never happened. The Qin dynasty is what I have referred to as China's bad boyfriend. He's the kind of boyfriend that doesn't like the fact that you had other boyfriends. And so wants you to destroy all your text messages, all your photos, get rid of all your emails, get rid of all your snaps, get rid of all your WhatsApp conversations. And you know what? How about those friends who don't really like me all that much? We should get rid of them too. And all of those things like in your diary, burn your diary and your stuffed animals, get rid of them. Many of you have had that kind of boyfriend. And how did it make you feel? And how you felt, you probably didn't go, oh, great, I'm burning my diaries for this boy. You probably thought in your heart of hearts, in your head of heads, WTF, man, what's wrong with you? And so China felt about the chin, which is why it only lasts 15 years. Confucius and his obligations, burn it. Well, a lot of the Confucian scholars bury it. They're like, we will outlast this guy. We're going to bury it so we can save the culture. This will be something that we will see later in our 102 in modern China with the uh, Cultural Revolution, the destruction 
of imperial and Western cultural artifacts. Chronicles of the great past leaders destroy them. There was no great past leader. See, if there is no evidence that you had any other boyfriends, then you didn't. And I must be the best one. That's the thinking. Without any competition, I must, by definition, be the best. Third is an emphasis on monumental construction, massive stuff built by essentially slave labor. The Great Wall, a Great Wall, it's not the Great Wall. If you stand on the Great Wall, that was built by the Ming and the Qing in the early modern period. But a Great Wall is built to kind of, it, it serves as the border. It links older walls. And it's to keep out the barbarian invaders. But it's 3,000 miles long. And who was it made by? Essentially unpaid workers. It was paid off by a, quote, tax obligation. So instead of giving the government money, which then like the Romans would then take that money, pay people to go and build the baths of Diocletian. Instead, it's, I don't want your money. I want you to work for me. And so building the Great Wall is itself an act of power. Look at what I can make you do. Just like burning Confucius is, look at what I can make you do. Oh, you love this little book? I can make you burn it. The building of the Terracotta Army. 8,000 soldiers, 130 chariots. Think about who had to make that, how long it take, took to make it. And then one of the amazing things is they're all individuals. It is itself an army. I'm sure the people who were making it made backstories for the different soldiers as they were making it. But who does this? And that's the question mark. It's not that, that he did it. It's who else does such a, such a big thing? And how, why, and how do you make it, uh, how do you make people do it for you? The death of the emperor, the death of the Qin emperor equal to a weak successor. No one feared him. They feared Huang. They feared the first Qin dynasty. The first, first Qin emperor. He was a military man. He conquered China. They feared him. They respected him. Then his, you know, successor comes along. Hi! the new chin i'm in charge and they china went no you're not and so the nobility and the people revolt china breaks up into pieces you get the warring states and within a year you get the immediate victory by the han by what become the han dynasty which will last for 400 years so are they successful yes they're the longest lasting success. So if the Chin are China's bad boyfriend, the Han are the boyfriend you marry. And in fact, we see this because 80, the largest ethnic group in China, what you consider to be Chinese, when we say Chinese, what, we, what you think of and what we really mean is Han. Because there's lots of other ethnicities. There's lots of other people who make up China. But the Western notion of, quote, Chinese is actually Han Chinese. So how do they last so long? Well, kind of like you dating a bad boy, dating a bad boyfriend. What do you want your next boyfriend to be like? Why don't you take a break and you have time to yourself and you, you heal, right? What do you want the next person to be like? You want them to be the opposite. Whatever the, the, the bad boyfriend did, you want them to be opposite. If the bad boyfriend was uncaring, you want them to be caring. If the bad boyfriend didn't respect your privacy, you want someone who does. And that's the Han. The Han are the anti-Chin. So the Chin were selfish. The Chin were all about them. Look at what I can make you do. I can make you destroy the Great Chronicles. I can make you destroy Confucius. I can make you work for me. So what did a chin do? The opposite. So instead of being selfish, they want to show a connection. We're all in this together. We're connected, me and you. And is there a philosophy out there about connections? Yeah, that's Confucius. So 
the legitimacy of the Han is going to be based on Confucius. They're going to resurrect Confucius. They're going to bring him back and say, we will be Confucian. One, Confucian is Chinese. Two, it's pre-Chin. Three, it emphasizes connection. It emphasizes responsibilities. It emphasizes position. Four, it says, don't revolt. Haha, -ha, remember, the Han are revolutionaries. The Han overthrew the Chin. And now they're going to bring in a philosophy that says, don't revolt. Smart. But it also says, I have an obligation to you, which the Chin didn't think they did. So what is that obligation? Well, the first is to make people's lives better. Well, how do you make people's lives better? By not getting invaded, first of all, by the constant invasion of the Western and, Nor and Northern barbarians. So the first way of making people's lives better is defeat and push back the Western nomads, of which the most famous group that they'll defeat are the Huns. Now, those Huns will be defeated and then come crashing across Central Asia, beat up lots of, they leave history. They literally leave history. The, the, Ch the Chinese chronicles go, we have defeated these people who modern historians believe are the Huns and they have left. You know, they have gone West. Goodbye. Don't come back. And then there's nothing about them. Well, what are they doing? They're crossing the great step, smashing their way across Turkish and Persian tribes, you know, speaking tribes, nomadic tribes, going into the, 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 the force of Russia, popping out in Poland and crashing into the Goths. Then the Goths crash into the Romans and boom, the Huns are back in history. So the Huns are most, the most famous of the Western nomads, the Han, H-A-N, will be beat up. And the idea of that is to protect people from invasion, right? And we've talked about how geography meant there was this constant threat of invasion. Now, if you look at the map on the video, you will see this is a much bigger China than Chin China was. It extends farther to the south and farther to the west. The second thing is to unify and pacify the people of the south. So we're going to expand to the south. We're going to protect the Yangtze River Valley. We're going to protect the Han heartland. We're going to protect the Chinese heartland. So how are we going to do it? Well, one is to go north, push against the northern barbarians, right? The second is to push south and pacify it. Open it up to settlement. It's good uh, land for farming. So we're going to assimilate and integrate with the peoples of the South. And we're going to make that into, instead of a frontier, first it will become a frontier, then it will become part of China. And as the Han push West against the Western nomads, that Southern part will become part of the heartland as if it was n never not part of China. So it becomes, the southern part becomes the agricultural heartland. It's where the food is made. It's where the farmers are. It's where the people are. The effect, though, is it's poorer. It's more backward. It's more rural than the northern parts. It's less militarized than the northern parts. So when uh, dynasties die, almost always, there's, a, there's one and a half there's one clear exception to that rule. And then there's the Chiang Kai-shek exception, um, which depends on how you count. Since he's not creating a new dynasty, it depends on how you want to count it. But there's only one to two exceptions in all of Chinese history of the South conquering the North. It's usually a Northern kingdom conquering the South. They're more militarized, they're more frontier, and they're more, they have more mercenaries. They have more help from northern and western barbarians to bring in. So we are so what the Han do is one, beat up the Western barbarians, nomads, especially the Han, Huns. That's to protect people. The second is give them farmland. 
unify and pacify the people of the South and create an agricultural heartland that opens up farmland, that opens up land. People can now move who don't have any land, who want more land, and it becomes part of China. So they're making more money. And then three, help people make more money. And that means connecting China to other civilizations. Ultimately, if all you do is sell your goods to Chinese people, it's a closed circular system. You're not getting, you individually might get richer, but China's not getting richer. To make money, China needs to sell stuff to foreign peoples and bring in their money. This is kind of mercantilism 101. You got to get other people's money. Otherwise, you're in a closed system where you're just basically, uh, as as Americans would say, paying, taking from Peter to pay Paul. You know, it's the same money. It's just one person has more of it than the other person. But in, in terms of the economy of China, it doesn't grow. It's just, it's it's like a, a dryer, you know, with, with uh, towels in it just spinning in circles. You're not adding anything. To help people make money and get actually wealthier, you need to connect China to other civilizations. And that is the Silk Road, which means you have to build connections across the steppe where the Western nomads are, which means you have to pacify the Western nomads until you reach India, until you reach the Middle East, Persia, Bactria. And you have to create towns along the way, rest stops, just like on the turnpike along the way that people can stop, people can rest, people can sell stuff. And that will be what's what we call the Silk Road. So the Silk Road, which will connect Eastern China all the way to Europe. It is China's connection to the outside world. It allows for a massive amount of money. Every town along the way will be huge in making money. Samarkand, Merv in, in Afghanistan, rich, rich cities. It allows for the transference of technology. So things China is advanced on go west, but things China is behind on come east. It allows for the transference of knowledge. This is Buddhism. Literally merchants and teachers and, and monks can travel these roads looking for work, looking to make money, looking for a place, looking to convert people. So now it opens up. This transference of not only technology, but of knowledge, of stories. There's the Chinese, the famous Chinese story, Journey to the West. That's on the Silk Road. There's also the stories of the monks, the Buddhist monks coming east. So Buddhism comes east. Luxury goods go west. The Silk Road allows for population size plus stability and unity. Because China has such a large population, because it is stable, because it is unified, because there is a China, it will dominate global trade, which equals massive wealth coming in. In fact, this is one of the things that in our History 102 and our History 150, our East Asian history class, we'll talk about because the British will go to China in the 17 and 1800s and say, all right, buy our stuff. And the Chinese emperor will literally tell them, you don't have anything we need. So we're going to take your money. Thank you. We're going to take your gold. And the British say, no, 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 no. I like my gold. I will give you iron. And the Chinese emperor goes, we have plenty of iron. And this is where the opium war comes in because the British are going to say, well, we're going to sell you drugs. And the emperor is going to say, no, you're not. That's crazy. And the British are basically going to point a gun at the emperor and the emperor's towns and say, if you don't let us sell drugs, we will blow stuff up. And the Chinese emperor goes, that's crazy drug fuel talk. Are you people on drugs? And the British say, no, we're not on drugs. We're trying to sell you drugs. First rule of selling drugs is don't use the drugs. And the Chinese emperor's going to go, this is crazy talk. Just give us the money. Take the tea, take the silk, give us the money. And the British are like, no, 
we're going to give you drugs and we're going to take Hong Kong. And then we're not going to give it back for 200 years. Wait till we get to imperialism and history 102. Or this this period of China, the 1820s through 1900 period of China in our history 150. It is a, a it is both infuriating, confusing, and like full of WTFs. Like people acted this way? And you go, yeah, because they had guns. Because they had industrialization. Because the British could. So China for the next 2000 years, or essentially till the 1700s, will dominate global trade. Remember, Columbus wants to get to China. The Portuguese, while happy to get to India, want to get to China. The goal is always China. And it is China that creates the luxury goods. It is China that will dominate global trade, whether it is silk, whether it is porcelain, whether it is tea. It is China that will dominate global trade, which brings in massive amounts of wealth. So when the Europeans show up, they're stunned by just how wealthy ordinary Chinese people are, like ordinary merchants are, have an education. There's a deep civilization. So China goes, so this, so what all that money fuels is urbanization, education, technology. It allows for the assimilation, the creation of, quote, China as a civilization. It binds it all together. The things that aren't happening in India, not that India doesn't have wealth, not that it doesn't have um, trade, but because of its geography, it's not able to pull all those cultural parts together the way China is able to do. So China goes from being two, the, the land between two rivers to being continental. It goes north to the forests, south to the sea, and west to the mountains. And people start to identify themselves as Han, and that becomes the designation for traditional Chinese, the heartland Chinese, the main ethnic group of China. So how does the Han collapse? Because it collapses, and so it's doing well. Well, what it ends up with is a series of child emperors. Which in and of itself is not bad. So what does it mean? It means you have a regency. R-E-G-E-N-C-Y. You have a regency. You have a bunch of adults who run the show while the emperor is too young to run it himself. Okay? Now the thing about regencies are they are usually built to balance each other out. It's usually within the family. It's the mother. It's an uncle. They tr they balance, and what they do is is willfully or not. Usually, it's to protect the child, protect their future ambitions. Now, you may get an uncle who tries to kill the child and become emperor himself. That happens from time to time, uh, in lots of societies. But the idea basically is they balance, which means nothing gets done. Because someone has an ambitious idea and they will get two or three people to vote against it. And so in the end, things begin to fall apart because they're not getting done. Now that's okay. That's all right. Why? Because the expectation is for a child emperor will one day be an adult, will be a 21 year old man, will become emperor in his own right, will tell his mom he doesn't want to listen to her anymore, will tell his, will send his uncle out to the west somewhere, and will run things as an emperor. And then we'll fix the stuff. We'll say, thank you, mom. Thank you, uncle. But I'm running things now. And we'll be, and then we'll be in charge from their 20th year to their 50th or 60th year. A long period of stability where they can have plenty of time to fix stuff. Fix bridges, clear roads, get rid of bandits, all that kind of stuff. Right? The uncle gets thanked and as long as he wasn't a jerk, he's given a command out in the West. Go and beat up as many nomads as you want. Right? Mom gets to the palace. They get to have dinner once or twice a week. It's nice. 
She gets to promote the ladies in waiting she wants to promote. Maybe she's involved in his marriage. Right? She's still a power at court. But you have an adult. Well, what's happening at the end of the Han is that child becomes emperor, gets married, has a child, dies. So we now have another 20 years of waiting for the child to become emperor. And then that child, that emperor got married, had kids, and then died. And so we have another 20 years. So things that, that were a problem, a bridge that needed repairs during the first child emperor has fallen into the river by the third child emperor. Things are really... The child emperor themselves aren't the problem. It's the series of child emperors so that things continue not to get done. All right. So what we need is an adult to take over, have a long reign, have some stability. Not a problem. As long as nothing bad happens, well, what happens? A death cult you known as the Yellow Turban. If you have ever played the video games of like Dynasty Warriors, the Yellow Turban pop up. They want a religious revolution. They want to obliterate the emperor. They want to bring heaven crashing down on earth. They want an apocalypse to happen so that they can get into heaven. So that heaven comes to earth. They will be rewarded. They are an apocalyptic death cult. Now, I don't care how young your child emperor is or how stuck in status your regency is. You can't allow a religious death cult to blow up the world and end civilization. Something has to be done. And so what do you do? You call out powerful generals from powerful families. And those powerful generals create private armies. Why? Because they're not loyal to the emperor or the, the emperor can't command. The emperor is a child. Notice this is not a problem the Roman Empire had because the emperor was a general. That was the name emperor. Emperor meant general. And so a child couldn't become emperor. It had to be an adult one way or the other. But in China, it was a position. It was a religious political position. It was a dynastic position. And so you were holding the position for later. So you get powerful generals who create private armies, who those private armies are loyal to the general. And what those generals then do is fight over who will dominate the emperor. They will sweep out the regency and they will fight over who gets to control the emperor. Since the emperor is a child, he'll do what he's told. And if one tries to do it, cow cow, the others will try to stop him. And boom, you have the warring states. China breaks up into pieces. It has the warlords who then fight each other. And it starts as some 20 plus uh, little countries. And then they consolidate into three big nations, three big Chinas that are called the romance of the three kingdoms. And the story of this, the story of the death cult, the child emperors, the powerful generals, the um, private armies, the cow cow, C-A-O, C-A-O, trying to dominate the emperor and marry his daughter to the emperor so he would become emperor. He would be the father of the emperor and essentially absorb all the power. Uh, the hero Lu Bu, who is both like a Homeric Achilles, but also like a jock. The story of this collapse is the romance of the three kingdoms and is one of the first novels written anywhere in the world. And it tells this tale and has heroes and magic and legend and history. It is massive. It has a thousand ca characters. It is 800,000 words. It is Tolstoy. It is Tolstoy. It is war and peace in the Western canon. It is that sweeping of a tale. And thus it has given us TV shows and movies and it is the romantic period of Chinese art. It is something all Chinese artists can refer to. Poets will refer to it. Playwrights will still write, write plays about this period. 
because it's heroes and magic and legends and a little bit of history. Though the history is not its goal. Romance of the Three Kingdoms is not a history book. And it's men and women and love and death and all of that kind of stuff. But the fact is the Han Dynasty dies. It dies out. It is replaced by a warring states period that will last for 100 years. You will get a unified China for a little while and then the Tang will come in, sweep everything aside and take over and be kind of the next massive great dynasty. And they will do it in the age of Charlemagne in the 7 and the 800s. So that's the end of the Han. Thank you. Be careful. Don't date bad emperors. <laughs>